Well, good morning. So it's um, great to be back at Stanford. I'm always sort of thrilled to uh, uh, be associated with one of the world's great universities and to uh, speak in front of faculty and students where the admissions committee would have never let me have a place. Um, so so it's, uh, it's uh, particularly thrilling to sort of uh, share my thoughts, be outside the box a little bit. I'm not quite sure what my title meant either, Sally. Uh, people kept uh, calling going, you have to have a title for the talk. You have to have a title for the talk. And so it's sort of what came to my head because it's what I work on um, every day, uh, uh, trying to devise uh, something that is radical and has some degree of inflection possibility and uh, some potential to be transformative, not just to uh, our energy systems and to the health of the planet, uh, but to communities and to people. Um, um, you know, I have these double hats uh, where I work on natural resources as a conservationist, which used to sort of just be a passionate hobby. Now it's quite integral to my work and my professional acumen as an energy developer or an energy technologist. You know, I view these things as uh, uh, completely symbiotic, uh, uh, mutually reinforcing, things that have to uh, um, both be taken in equal measure of importance to understand the greater problems that we're trying to solve. You know, at the end of the day, we say that uh, uh, nature doesn't really need us people. So all this talk about saving the earth is a little bit excess hubris on our part. It's really about saving ourselves. The earth will be fine. The question is, what is the longevity of our species and what is the quality of interaction we have uh, for our humanity and for our communities? And so energy is not just sort of a part-time thing that we watch the ups and downs of the price of a barrel to see how secure we are or how much tailpipe emissions we can measure out the back door. Energy is actually the life blood of what creates affluence and prosperity and lifts up people in society to give them the opportunities to interact and to be our best selves. So, so that's what I mean by crude code and capital. If I break it down, crude is not just sort of a barrel. Uh, it's not only oil and gas and, and the things that we like to measure our society's wealth by. Crude itself can be any of the raw natural resources, not just the mining and the metal and the extractives and the things that are on the commodity exchanges, but as or more importantly now than ever, the things that we don't measure the things that are insufficiently accounted for, the natural capital of our fisheries and our forest and our mangroves that would have been so useful had the port of Houston not paved them over in the wake of these storms. Um, lots of that's going on here at Stanford, so it's useful for me to talk about it when I refer to the natural capital project and the idea that we can break the tyranny of accounting systems and think and design beyond them in ways that we not only account for what the true gold and value is for us as a species, for the habitats that we seek to nourish and protect us, but that we can begin to value them in such a way that we integrate that value into our economy and monetize them in exchanges so that we understand natural capital has all the value of the extractive commodities that we have so efficiently began to deplete from our ecosystems. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about crude. Code, similarly, is not just the useful exiting undergraduate into the high value paying jobs of Silicon Valley at exorbitant prices so that they can become software engineers at Google with lots of massages and sushi bars. That's not code. Code is actually everything that is going on in the technological revolution on the back of those bits and bytes, including artificial intelligence and machine learning that is outpacing the way our education systems are scaling opportunity for most of the country. That's what code is. It's the technological innovation that we in Silicon Valley are blessed in almost a seemingly endless Florentine era at the epicenter of innovation to consider systems normal but that doesn't actually proliferate or translate across most of the country. And so the people most responsible for code here in Silicon Valley or in Boston or in Austin or in other highly educated centers of innovation all too often look at the people in this country and elsewhere that are responsible for natural resources and they say dismissive things. You dinosaurs can't drill your way out of this. And then the son of a Greek goat herder shows up with something like natural, uh, with uh, something like uh, 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 hydrofracking and, and uh, sort of proves him wrong, that actually you can drill your way out, at least for a time, at least at a measurable cost, 
We're not sure whether that cost is worthwhile or not, but yeah, we can turn drilling into a manufacturing process on a completely reliable basis and understand how much yield we'll get from the Permian Basin and bra break the back of OPEC in ways that we couldn't have conceived of when the President of the United States said we're addicted to oil. We can actually devise cures for that and mitigate what the, what the uh, effects of Saudi Aramco are on the world. That doesn't necessarily mean we've solved all of our problems. And then those in Houston and the headquarters of those great institutions look over here in the Silicon Valley and cleantech and all the kids at garages and all the activity in Sand Hill Road and everything that's going on in Google and X Labs, and they say, oh, solar, cleantech, that's the technology of the future. And it always will be. That's the great inside joke if you're from the oil and gas belt. And they don't understand for a minute the stochastic nature of the inexorable evolution and progress of technology. And however lumpy it may be, however they predict the price points too high at any given snapshot in time, the inev inevitable inexorable progress continues until ultimately we hit these points of inflection. And I've got to see it. I've got to see it not just now at one of these last GCEP convenings. I was here at the very first of the GCEP convenings. And back then, as a young presidential appointee arriving immediately after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita had devastated and basically removed and evacuated a major United States city full of culture and history, at that point, when all of our rigs were knocked off our platforms and our oil price went in a 12-month span from $25 to $147 for a record price, and before there was a financing crisis, before there was a housing crisis, there was an energy crisis where people had to choose between filling their tanks or paying their gas bills or paying for food and grocery. At that point in time, when addiction to oil meant most, somebody informed me I could come to Silicon Valley and get them to translate white papers into business plans. That if only the US government could play an inductive role and begin to catalyze entrepreneurship where it marries university scholarship in such a way that people could possess license and take risk, we could scale to unprecedented heights the amount of capital formation necessary to have a consequential impact in a time frame that was relevant. And that's what we did sort of 13, 14 years ago. And that's why there are more the Department of Energy officials today associated with Stanford University of qualified competence and importance like Lynn, who you just heard, Arun Majumdar, Steve Chu, Kathy Zoy, the list goes on. Folks are here because Washington is positively boring by contrast. We went from an era of immense bipartisan, arguably nonpartisan problem solving the seriousness of rolling up the sleeves and saying, what does it take to get things done? Passing monumental legislation and statutes with both a Republican Congress and then a Democratic Congress in 24 months, comprehensive omnibus energy legislation. And people say, oh, there's no such thing as national energy policy. Yes, there is. In the United States, it's called statute. When you pass laws, comprehensive laws, one upon another, it forms things. And that's how we got the Title 17 Loan Guarantee Program with, with $80 billion for clean energy that avoids sequesters or reduces carbon. That's how we got cafe reform, vehicle efficiency reform, building efficiency reform, what people thought was the phase out of incandescent lighting, but actually turned out to be a revolution in LED lighting. There's no such thing as a commercial building built today that doesn't start with LED lighting. You can go across Palo Alto here and you can see that Tesla's plug-in vehicles are the Camrys of Palo Alto. I mean, they're so frequent around. Right? And, 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 and uh, I can tell you there wasn't a single one on the road 10 years ago. In fact, in that first trip out here, I had the privilege of the CEO of Tesla giving me the first ride in the first Tesla. And I sat there and looked at the graphite block Roadster, and I thought, if I get into this sort of lithium battery tied together miniature machine, you know, refitted Lotus, is it going to blow up? Sure enough, it stalled out a few blocks from the factory. Um, I, you know, I sort of looked at the Martin Hamburger, and I said, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of press back there. Do you want me to walk or hitchhike, or how do you play it? And uh, you know, later on, fortunately, I ended up being part of an investment in Tesla. But but uh, we've we've changed. We've imagined what the future could look like with electrified drivetrains and alternative vehicles 
vehicles and light weighting and carbon, carbon materials uh, science dominating the way that we address our addiction to oil. And at the same time, simultaneously, they changed in, 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 uh, in, the, in the land that I grew up in, in Texas. And they said, well, not only can we get this on a reliable basis, we can do it in an increasingly environmentally sensitive manner. In fact, we have no choice. If we don't pay attention to seismicity, if we don't pay attention to water consumption, if we don't pay attention to community development, the industry will end. So there's an existential threat out in natural resource land, and it's not coming purely from the obsolescence of what's going on in tech land. And there's a real need out in tech land to understand what the transition looks like as we move to peak demand of natural resource extraction. And that's really what we're facing, a multi-decadal transition that requires comparable nonpartisan leadership that goes after not just majority one majority plus one of your own party but a two-thirds majority of both parties in ways that create durable sustainable predictable signals to the marketplace and to the technologists to keep innovating that's crude and code when they work at their best to reinforce one another and find themselves in symbiosis rather than in competition but what about capital oh capital for years and years, people say, oh, if I just had an innovative source of capital, if I could just conform capital to my invention, then the world would be that much better. Um, instead of sort of saying, how do I create a business model that conforms to capital systems? And the truth is, we need innovation in capital systems as much as we need the innovation in the technologies, in the nanotech, the biotech, and the clean tech itself. And what does that innovation look like? It's not sort of tweaking the financial products of a fiat currency from Bretton Woods, right? We have so much different forms of capital evolving in the 21st century that we have to take very seriously for the intrinsic nature of what capital actually is. We have virtual capital. Well, what is that? It's Bitcoin. They laugh at it. Bitcoin's just a product. It rides on the blockchain. The blockchain is the most consequential development and evolution of interaction in bits and bytes since the creation of the World Wide Web. Bitcoin may be the first or the last of the virtual currencies, but it sets a demonstration and a mark for how peer-to-peer -peer trusted exchange can and will likely continue to evolve outside the jurisdiction of governments and with very little choice by governments of that inevitable trend. And since technology is never actually benign, since technology will either be incredibly disruptive as we have experienced in the best, most beneficial way in clean tech, or it will fortify and calcify the status quo as we are seeing in the lockdown and the use of it by autocracies to monitor people's homes in the way that Brave New World contemplated. Since it's never benign, we have to be on top of it. We have to have technology, employed and harnessed in the service of humanity. And so clean tech, nanotech, biotech, infotech will all amount to not if we do not concentrate ourselves by design on humanitech. How do we take these technologies to serve society's interest and not lose sight that the goal is not merely lessening tailpipe emissions or capturing carbon at the flu? The goal has to be the equitable, just servicing of our society to better the nature of our interactions amongst each other as we, pro as we elongate our species and our habitat's uh, uh, survival here. That's a bigger thing than saying it's all solved in the era of abundance. We have enough oil, we have enough gas, we're, we're, we're humming on technology, boy, the real estate prices are good, everybody's prospering. That is insufficient relative to the problem set that we face when we talk about a tragedy of the commons. And what is that tragedy? Well, there's the classic economic version. We all know the story of the Boston commons and nobody having ownership. I view it as perverse market incentives, misaligned policy, and insufficiently or inappropriately applied technology. Perverse market incentives, well, you know, the car I've got is worth more than $100,000. I never as a kid thought I would be in such a car. But there's enough market incentives out there between subsidized interest rates and low payments that would induce me to be in it. But that's not enough that it's fun and it's got torque and it's the first time since I'm 16 years old I enjoy driving around. It's not enough. The taxpayer should give me an extra $7,500 for the privilege of driving it at a time that people in East Palo Alto can't get $7,500 together for bus fare for a year of commuting to their place of work that they inevitably have to leave their towns to find. 
There is something incredibly misaligned and perverse in that. And we have to be corrective in our policy prescriptions so that we don't find ourselves in Palo Alto juicing our Teslas with photovoltaic panels that we can buy at Home Depot, sipping electrons with our Nest thermostats that we control on our iPhones and barely paying anything to leave the gunk and debris of the depreciated grid to those who can't afford access to the solutions that are inevitably increasingly differentiated and balkanized by economic choice. We have got to be attentive to designing the utility of tomorrow and reimagining the society we want to have. This is not actually beyond our reach. It is a compelling obligation and imperative for places like Stanford to think ahead because we have the opportunity to think in such an integral and social conscious way. And we've done it before, like a century ago. Something happened. We even iconographically associate great ideas with a light bulb. Used to be an incandescent light bulb. Since we get rid of incandescence, we don't think of it that way anymore. But used to be, when you had a good idea, you'd put a light bulb over your head. Oh, what a good idea. And that idea was so big and so powerful that we could turn night into day that we could allow people to read after they came in from the fields of a long day's labor. It was so powerful that we as a society made a declaration, everybody must have it. It has to be uniform. It has to be universally accessible. It has to be affordable. It has to be reliable. And we made a social compact with ourselves. We even created government agencies to ensure the funding and the extension of the very last mile to the very last outhouse that everybody should have lumens at night because they were part of our society. That was our original social compact with energy. And now we've done the right thing. We've induced all of these new points of light through the internet of things and machine learning and electrification of drive trains and autonomous vehicles and soon autonomous vehicles that can fly. We've done all these things and we'll continue to do them for the right reasons, for the beneficence on society and our environment. But will we take care and integrate with comparable precision and with comparable priority the need to have universal and uniform access to all so that we ensure that the opportunity that derives from those new technologies is shared in an equitable way that lifts us all up for the society we want to form? Those are the core questions that we have for the tragedy of the commons. It's not sufficient to say, boy, we've got low and steady priced natural gas as far as the eye can see. I grew up with that. $2 natural gas. We used to have 30 dollar 30 year contracts on natural gas when we build a power plant in the 1980s. Okay? And 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 so we're back. So we're back. And then we went through the cycle where using natural gas for a power plant was like using Hennessy XO to wash your socks. It was just nuts. Why would you? It's so precious. Hold on to every last drop of it and then all of a sudden we're back and no, time's good again. One thing that we know for sure when we vacillate between national security and economic distress from our reliance on hydrocarbons, that even in an era of abundance, we do not remove ourselves from the era and the endemic and intrinsic nature of volatility associated with those sources of energy. So we have to wean ourselves from it in a way that lifts us all up. And that's what we mean by a radical remedy of the commons. We mean trying to find the symbiosis between our humanity and our communities and our natural surroundings. We mean understanding the actual value of all the natural resources, whether we're burning them or whether we're trading them or whether we're conserving them so that those trees that Lenore rightfully says is the best technology that's not going to be surpassed. We're not going to have a better oxygen making carbon consuming machine than a tree. So how do we have more of them? That's radical remedies. At Emerson, we try to think of it very simply and very formulaically. What are the most differentiated solutions to the highest value problems that accelerate the pace of maximum impact? That's our sort of very simple spectrum on things. If you want to reduce it, it is how do you think differently and deploy as quickly as possible to scale in the most impactful way? That's what we do. Well, there's lots of things that are differentiated. Um, 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 you know, electric skateboards are differentiated. I see them all up and down the streets of Palo Alto, but they're not a very high value problem. Um, I love solar panels and the revolution that came about that, but they're commoditized like, you know, Ked's tennis shoes in Chinese factory number 17 now. So high value problem, but very low differentiation. 
We've got to focus on, in these halls of Stanford, and I think you're seeing it on the poster boards outside, the differentiated solutions to the highest value problems. That has always been the hallmark of this university, as Jim Sweeney once reminded me. And so trying to understand gas densification, whether it's carbon molecules or methane molecules, how do we compress and store and transport gases? That's a huge thing. If we were only addressing flaring, you know, that would be an enormous thing. Do we have to build an a, a LNG facility to send these, you know, mobile bombs into ports all around the world through, a, you know, uh, uh, sipping a straw in the abundance of shale to get to a usable economy for natural gas? Or is there a way to end flaring altogether with densification and porosity of, of nano uh, uh, level materials and absorptive materials, metal organic frameworks? What else can we think of? What else can we imagine in the way that we imagined electric cars or cars that drove themselves when everybody outside of Silicon Valley said that that's nuts? It'll never happen 120 months ago. So that's where I want, I think I should leave it, Sally. That's where I think I should leave the challenge uh, uh, for today is, is think holistically. Try to bring all of these disparate elements of our energy economy together without accepting that something is more superior and something is more subordinate because it wasn't originated here or because we own the idea first. Think holistically about how to bring the parts of this country together in the Rust Belt and in Appalachia and in the oil patch with the brilliant centers of innovation in Boston and Austin and Silicon Valley because our national leaders aren't, and we have to, here. Political obsolescence has set in. That is, we have so much dysfunction at the highest levels of erstwhile leadership that they have rendered themselves no longer a part of the rational conversation for problem solving in this country at this time. That's tragic, but that's where we are. Individuals, unfortunately, as we're finding out from our fellow Americans living without water for days, people whose children served in our military and risked their lives going hungry in the United States of America, individuals aren't positioned in a catch-as-catch-can way, every man for himself, to advance these things. So somewhere in between political obsolescence of a nation state and overcoming to a degree the mythology of rugged individualism solving everything, we have got to form the collaborative communities that have contagion in problem solving and figured out shared ideas and shared solutions to patch us back together. I was shocked when I came back to America, to be honest with you, after 12 years abroad, and people explained to me that these were the red states and these were the blue states. It was the, simply the most shocking notion for a kid who was at the Berlin Wall chipping away at it after 40 years of Cold War and the receding existential threat of nuclear weapons for somebody to come back to me after going abroad to make a new world order and say, oh, which state are you from? The red ones or the blue ones? Because one of them is not the good guys. I had no idea. I was sending postcards from Texas with iron horses of mines and going, hey, this is, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, wellheads. This is what we do in Texas. Cadillacs with big horns, it's funny, caricature. You know, what are you doing in California? Surfboards, everything else. To come back and know that we were divided by the basis of where we were from is one of the greatest misfortunes perpetrated on us, now being exploited by our erstwhile leadership. Here at Stanford, here with this technology, with this subject matter, with this track record, with the analog of experience that we have, we have an incredible opportunity to evaporate that kind of foolish thinking. We can take green and let it cover over everything about red and blue. We can take innovation and make problem solving superior to scapegoating and division. But only if we connect the dots beyond the tailpipe, beyond the flu, beyond the electrons, beyond the uh, nano and material science, and understand it's a question of our humanity and our dignity and the build out of our communities. So those are the radical remedies of the commons, and you are the folks to make the radical remedies, and I'm so privileged to be amongst you and share with you a little bit about our insight 
and to work with you in the days, months, and years ahead to make it real. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Do you want me to take some questions? I didn't hear you say anything about income redistribution because the incandescent light bulb, uh, as far as I know, wasn't sponsored by the government. It was made available and people bought it because they had the money to buy it. And what's your point? My point is that you, you're, you're asking for a revolution or change, Always. But, but you didn't talk about income re redistribution to make the make all these wonderful things we're doing here uh, uh, affordable to people who have no training, have no money, who are, voting, who are not voting for us. <clears throat> I, think, uh, I think I understand your question, but if I'm answering it the wrong way uh, per your question, feel free to correct me. Um, 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 there's two angles to that. There's a, su uh, a supply side and a demand side relative to the pricing that affects low-income people. Right? On the supply side, the, there used to be a very strong argument by the incandescent light bulb producers that we're only two cents and your LED light bulb is three bucks. Um, and, and they'd go, we can never leave incandescence because it's three bucks. Okay? And you know, we, we, the government had a lot of different obligations. How do we take the price of LEDs down to a comparable price? But also, how do we regulate the standard so that we induce the market to, on a fair and equitable basis, to compete that price downward. So when we came up with a lighting standard, everybody said, you're, you're, you know, uh, um, uh, you've gone Marxist. You're phasing out incandescent light bulbs. Okay, and, and uh, uh, by and large, uh, by, by the way, this was uh, many of uh, the same folks that are uh, against that standard today voted for it. Okay, and because and, uh, by God, I'm going to have my incandescent. I'm going to cook an egg on that thing. You're not going to take that heat away from me, baby. And, 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 and this, is, this is not just for lighting. We saw this with 1.6 flush toilets. Same argument. Boy, it costs a third of the cost and to, have, uh, uh, to have a four-gallon flush toilet than a 1.6. So I'm going to Canada. By God, I'll get a two flushes in before I take a 1.6 efficient flush toilet. Right? People are married to inefficient and backward technology. The government actually has an obligation at some level to say if it can be produced, if it is available, if it is good for society that we should share in it, Creating that standard actually induces a market and the prices collapse. And so today, where we had no LED lighting on, on, on the shelves at Home Depot, today it's dominated by LED lighting that is cost competitive. Moreover, people aren't having to climb their ladders to go change them because they last for 20 years at a pop. So the cost efficiency of that device came directly from government rule set, defining a market, government research, driving the price down, and having the insight and ability to project forward and say it is better for our citizens as a whole to have a new standard than to say every man for himself for two cent imported, 98% inefficient, 100-year-old technology to persist. Okay, now I believe that. Now if you still say, but there's a delta, it's still unfair that some people have more disposable income and other people have less disposable income, what do I do about that? I point to the California AB 32 and I say, well, California has today the world's most efficacious policy for pricing carbon and not simply because it works and there's a mechanism for, for what you would call redistribution, I would call uh, a useful taxation on environmental degradation and insecurity. Okay, but in that, there is a carve out of up to 35% that that funding is meant to directly go to the communities that are marked as lower income and distress. Okay, so we do have mechanisms. They're new and they're insufficiently tried. But I think it, it, uh, California as the laboratory right now in the United States and in the world of efficacious climate policy has it incumbent to get the implementation right and to prove out the question that you're asking. Can we get it right and make it equitable so choice exists? Okay. So it's very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. 
Thank um, you. Focusing all towards the humanity of who we are, I really appreciate it. Um, I guess we're probably all concerned about government research, funds coming in, government standards, and of course California is pushing the way. Do you have some general ideas or advice right now going through the federal government seems awkward if to say the least, um, about where we can go to make more of a difference here as a university or individuals in those areas? Uh, we go through California government because it is allowing us pliable to, to do it, or, or do you have any other thoughts about that? And, and this is specifically asking about government R&D? Government R&D, but also government standards, things that we can do because we have to through government institutions to, mm -hmm. like you say, make these changes that we need to make because they it, may not. It's a good question. Them. I will tell you, and as you can tell from my last answer, I'm very Sacramento-centric in my thinking these days. You know, functionally, um, uh, I like to go where things are getting done and where there's a willingness by people to listen in an exchange of ideas, however difficult or intransigent their positions may be, that they're ultimately focused on problem solving and constructiveness rather than deconstruction. So most of what I am concerned with in DC these days is playing defense on things like the Endangerment Finding and the Antiquities Act and the attack on efficiency standards, et cetera. I don't like defense. I think the best defense is a good offense. And the best offense today is Sacramento. And what we've seen under the leadership of Kevin DeLeon, the president of the Senate, um, uh, is uh, um, uh, incredible insight, foresight, and the capacity to galvanize. You know, the, the, the Republican head of the caucus, uh, uh, Chad May, uh, lost his job over creating a bipartisan agreement uh, 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 for, for cap and trade. So, so uh, along the lines of the a massive amount of money that is um, uh, inevitably going through that system, uh, uh, Senator Henry Stern has, has moved to, to uh, set up a California R&D facility uh, uh, modeled on ARPA-E, right? Now, California can't do it all. And, and there's a really good argument that it shouldn't, but it is a beacon for better ideas that are being integrated on a nonpartisan basis, I would argue. Now, I'm sure there's many, many uh, um, uh, in the Republican Party that say it's completely partisan. We just want there to be nothing going on. But if you actually want something to go on, there's a conversation to be had. Um, uh, in DC, the thing that gives me the greatest confidence about R&D is that, a, that there is a remainder of the legislative craftsmen, um, uh, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, that people would call the establishment, which I guess means experienced and wise, um, um, there's a remainder of them sufficient to enhance and protect uh, our national laboratories and ultimately the budgets, even as uh, those less informed about the value of correlating that R&D are, are trying to uh, erode them. I, I, the good thing is uh, the management is so abysmal in the executive branch that they don't actually know where all the uh, switches and buttons are. And, uh, and so uh, 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 the, uh, it feels like uh, those in the know will probably outlast them. I wonder if you have any quick thoughts on economic, economic uh, aid that can be pro provided to the people of Puerto Rico or other equivalent areas that are suffering from a destruction of their infrastructure and the like. Uh, I keep thinking distributed generation and yep. LED water purification. Yep. But how does something like that get put out? Well, there's a maturity of industry question. Uh, the technological and technical solutions, the engineering solutions that you, that you would say, what should we do most? What is the most resilient, intelligent, affordable, quickly accessible, clean source of energy that could be durable? If you, if you sort of put a spec around it, you'd say, does it exist? Yes. 
How do we get it there? Well, we've got the problem getting it to East Palo Alto because of a landlord agency problem when we're totally geared to credit markets and single family uh, uh, Caucasian homeowners in affluent suburbs in America. So, so it's the same sort of impediment of a distribution problem in the maturity of the system. You know, um, um, in oil, there are a whole company set up. A Greco worldwide is set up for nothing but uh, helping for immediate distributed energy power solutions at the mine mouth or uh, in a crisis or in a blackout. So who's there first? The guys who have institutionally stood themselves up. Now, there are lots of these companies that have been innovative over time, particularly for the Department of Defense and others, who do containerized, boxed, quick deployment. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Depender uh, Solution from Skoll actually has a, a brilliant company like this that works on a hybridized basis and, and quickly deploys. It was meant for telecom in India, you know, et cetera. But what are the mechanisms for these new emergent companies being galvanized through US agencies in a coherent, systemat systematic way for what the new grid should be? What they're going to end up doing, which will be unfortunate if they follow the law, and the law being the Stafford Act, which basically says you can only build back to the specification it was before. So let's take all the tax money we have and design for 1954 with rickety wooden poles because that's what we're legally bound to do. I mean, really dumb stuff. So, so, so first thing is to pull back the Stafford Act in the way that we pull back the Jones Act and say, blue sky. What should happen here? And the reality is there should be a grid in San Juan and distributed microgrids everywhere else, erected as fast as possible with the cleanest possible spec at the lowest possible price that market actors can bring to bear. And so uh, President Clinton has been um, convening on this. Uh, David Crane, the former CEO of NRG, Richard Branson. I've met with uh, lots of people to discuss this very question. And we know exactly what the design should be. The question is, what is the legal impediments to affording that design the opportunity to go forward. Meanwhile, while we sit and argue, we have American citizens without water and energy. It's absolutely dumbfounding. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Uh, Andy, good morning, and thank you for the heartening reminder of our state's leadership. If we look back at uh, fuel efficiency for vehicles, renewable portfolio standards for generation of electricity in our state, a question. If we look at a, a carbon calculator for a first world human being, uh, aviation is, 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 is maybe a third bucket there. What's, what's the probability that the state of California can create a market for human passenger aviation aircraft and radically drive the efficiency uh, down for those as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and the answer is completely tied and correlated to what class, what weight, what application of that aircraft. I mean, I was just this week looking at uh, uh, the race to uh, flying taxis, if you want, right? Uh, so how do we take a drone and size it into, the, into an SUV and uh, carry five to seven passengers and uh, have them right of way over the highways with uh, electric recharging and autonomous flight patterns, right? Is that fanciful? Count on it. You'll see it in the next five years. You'll bet, you know, and, and, and was that a far gone conclusion? We used to have helicopter delivery from SFO to downtown, but we had a decibel problem. So, so you know, we, we, can, we can crack the decibel problem, we can crack the efficiency problem, we can crack the fuel problem, but only in a certain size class. So now, if you've got a new size class of flight, what does that mean to, uh, 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 to mid-flight, to Beechcraft and Cessna and all the other sort of mid-operators? And, and, and unfortunately, the larger problem that you're probably talking about, which is Boeing and Airbus and, and transcontinental uh, aircraft, is, is the most difficult, the most intractable, and in all probability, the last one to solve. So it's also the one that behooves us to invest the most in material science and engineering. And of course, the gains there have been enormous, as we now have transcontinental aircraft with a uh, further reach than a 747 flying on two engines, right? And the efficiency in those planes are incredible. But the things that I see um, uh, in material science, a day when we can uh, uh, easily project airplanes having no windows and, and gaining 10% efficiency because you can touch the wall of it and see precisely what you want from any view, outside, up, down, whatever, with, with ocular indifference. That is, your eye could not detect whether it were a window or whether it's a wall because of the precision um, uh, in granularity and the, and the evaporation of pixelation. We're, we're so far beyond that. So the question is time and cost and the efficiency to make those things as seamless and sipping of fuel as possible. My prediction is that they'll be the last to get off 
of fuels as the most intractable problem, um, and I don't have a great solution. I mean, we saw the Green Hornet flying around and lots of biofuel sort of solutions, but, but um, uh, for my bet, it's uh, as much material science as you can put into the big ones and to electrify the small ones and have a lot more localized fleet movement. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very, very Thank you, guys. <laughs> Good luck today. Thanks. Thanks, I hope that was buzzy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>